Hey everybody, so an exciting day um, for the nationwide and for Manchester today that Adam Montgomery is guilty of all the charges. Um, I wanted to upload the presser for everybody in case you missed it and also since I've been covering the case since the beginning and I did a lot of the events as you can see in the playlist for Harmony Montgomery. I also have a set uh, separate playlist for the discussions that I do for Adam Montgomery's trials. Um, awareness isn't over for Harmony as they haven't found her. And also there needs to be change for CPS and we will get into that. So let me share the presser with you guys. difficult case in terms of the number of witnesses that had to testify that they had to listen to. This jury had to pay attention to 50 witnesses in a little over the course of roughly eight days. That's a lot of testimony. Um, there's a lot of different factors. You had multiple different charges. They had to consider the July uh, crime separate from what occurred in December and on forward. Um, that's a lot of work for a jury and they have done that. Um, very, very well. And so we were greatly appreciative to the jury's time and attention. They had to listen to facts that the Manchester Police Department and that the community have lived with. And I think a lot of people didn't really know all the facts until they actually heard and saw the witnesses at trial. And as a result of that, again, we're very, very grateful uh, for the jury for their time and their attention on this. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a very big relief that they have seen through and that they've held them accountable for the actions that he's committed. And as prosecutors and law enforcement, I know this isn't about you, but I can't help but notice that there are some tears in your eyes. This case is different. Uh, talk about that and why. I, I would say, I don't know if I would say it's different only because um, I know other statements that I've heard in the past is to say, why were so much time and resources put towards this little girl? And sometimes even from others saying, well, where are the resources for these other cases? Every person who is, has their life taken from them on murder, whether it is a five-year-old child or a 63-year-old man or a 45-year-old, every single person has a value of their lives. And so while some have said, why was so much attention here? Those, that attention is something that the Manchester Police Department that all of the different law enforcement agencies put into every homicide case in this state. And so this case was different in terms of some of the attention that it garnered, but not in terms of the value of Harmony's life or the value of anybody else's life being taken here in New Hampshire and having the same attention being brought to it and trying to hold those accountable uh, in a court of law, hold them accountable and have some justice. There was an extra dimension of community involvement because this started as a missing persons case. And it just feels like there is a more public vested interest in all homicides. I, I didn't mean to equivocate okay. this case, That's but okay. uh, there is a, a next level to this because of that community involvement from the moment of that New Year's Eve press conference where they said, help us find yeah. this little girl. And, and that community involvement has been tremendous. Uh, residents in Manchester, but not even just Manchester. So there were residents all around the country who had different tips. We heard some of that at trial with regards to tips that came in from Florida, from Arizona. And those tips were followed up on by uh, partners that we've worked with, the Manchester Police Department has worked with for years. And they were so important to being able to find even sometimes very, very minute pieces. Again, at trial, we heard about one particular tip in Arizona that was tracked down. And somebody thought that is worthwhile to call in to try to find somebody who was missing. And that mattered. And you might think it doesn't matter, but it really does matter. And that's the type of work that was done here. And it's not just the Manchester Police Department, although they have been lions in pursuing this case. Um, it's also the work of the partners that they've been able to team up with. That's New Hampshire State Police, New Hampshire Fish and Game uh, here in this state um, as well. I almost did the list. I got to remember uh, New Hampshire Department of Corrections and their investigative staff who have done also a fantastic job its counterparts in other states. As you heard during trial, uh, Massachusetts State Police, Massachusetts uh, State Police dive team, the Revere Police, 
You've heard in the trial, there was also had assistance from the Maine State Police, also from Maine Fish and Game, our federal partners, uh, Billy Tufts and everybody over there at the U.S. Marshal Service, as well as the United States Attorney's Office here in New, for the state of New Hampshire. Um, you also had a tremendous amount of work by the FBI in the search of 644 Union Street and other work there. If you want to talk about outside coalitions, not only those other departments, but the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, which does this work, not only on this case, but every missing adult and child that they can help out every day. You're also talking about some outside agencies like the New England Canine Search and Rescue, who volunteered their dogs to be able to help search on several different places. That is a community response. It's a national response. Um, and it could not be more appreciated in a moment like right now. Would you compare it to um, Harmony's mother? And you may have addressed this already, but she still hopes to find Harmony. Where does this mean the end of the search for Harmony? What? Excellent question. And the answer is it does not. One of the things that we could not state before, but we can more clearly state now after the verdict, is during trial, people heard the last place that Adam Montgomery had driven that U-Haul to. And I have some specifics on that. I'm hoping people are paying attention. Um, he had that U-Haul between March 3rd into March 4th in 2020. He drove 133 miles. We heard about that on that U-Haul. Subtracting back the 2.3 miles back and forth, I'm sorry, 3.2 from the rental, that left him with roughly a 106 mile road trip all the way down, at least through the Tobin to bridge tolls, we know, northbound, southbound, northbound again through those tolls, and then back to Manchester. That only left him with 26 miles of driving that he could have done between where he was at the Econo Lodge in Manchester and going through the Tobin those three times. What that means is, and we know that he went through no New Hampshire tolls, so what that means is that she is somewhere along that route. And you heard about the searches that have been done, specifically in the Rumney Marsh Reservation in Revere, around the Sales Creek area, the Chelsea Creek area, behind North Shore Road. Revere Police, Mass State Police have been relentless in searching those areas with the Manchester Police Department. Um, uh, these ladies and gentlemen drove down and worked with them hand in hand. Those are still our big areas of search and our big areas that we're hoping that somebody sees something. Everybody who might have seen the trial also would have seen the CMC bag. And there was a demonstrative that was used during trial. It was the exact same type bag. It had light tan, it was canvas, had dark colored straps, and had a CMC logo in the middle. That was positively identified by multiple witnesses as the bag that Adam Montgomery had the last night that he had that bag and the U-Haul. So that bag went somewhere along that route and somewhere within no more than 26 miles off of that route down and back to Revere. Um, also at this trial, what was pointed out was the fact that um, Adam uh, Montgomery was from the Revere area. He would know it very well. That is still a high area of interest. And we are still asking for anybody now who has heard this information, who's seen this information, if you see this bag, if you hear about this bag, if you walk in one of these areas, you, you take the dog out for a walk, if you see anything like that that seems to be disturbed, to please let us know. Um, you heard also a trial that Harmony's body was bagged up several times inside of that CMC bag. There's a high likelihood that there may still be parts of her that we can recover, part of her body, pardon me just for a second, part of her body that we can recover. Um, we're really hoping that we can do that. We really hope that she can get the burial that she deserves, that everybody deserves. Do you think they'll ever cooperate with you and, and your investigators and lead you to the body at any point? Do you have, do you have hope for that? Um, I don't know that I can speculate with regards to what Adam Montgomery thinks, the choices that he's made between uh, when he did this, the choice to do what he did, and then the choices he's made since then. Um, I can't speculate on what choice he may make in the future about whether or not to say where she is, but he knows where she is. So, Sam, Sam, what's, 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 what's your message to anyone who thinks they can dispose of a body and get away with murder in New Hampshire? Um, with regards to that, if anybody who thinks that they can do that, certainly we have cases every day where individuals do th things like that. They fall, try to falsify physical evidence. and. The work of law enforcement has been tireless 
to find out who they are, track them down, and hold them accountable. Go ahead. Hold on just a second. Right. She got you first. Have to be here for sentencing, or could we skip that as well? Under RSA 651 colon 4 A, and I know that's a mouthful, <laughs> uh, but underneath that particular statute, it says that a defendant shall be brought forward for a statement from a victim in a crime involving a homicide and needs to be here for sentencing unless otherwise excused by the court. That's the statute. Um, as you may have heard in the courtroom, we will be filing with the court and asking the court to enforce that RSA so that he is present for sentence. Right. This was a tough case. He, he, the, the victim has never been found, so he's probably even murder without a body. Um, and your star witness was somebody who had credibility issues, yet it only took the jury about seven hours to come back with a guilty verdict on all counts. Do you have any thoughts on, on how that all came together? Because that's not an easy thing to do. Well, I obviously don't know what the deliberations were back in the jury. That is sacrosanct with the jury. It's something that the, neither the court nor the parties will ever ask about. That's their decision making of how they went forward. But one of the things you saw at trial was the tremendous amount of corroboration here. So it wasn't just one person and their say so, even though that person say so could have been enough to simply find it guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. There were so many other parts to this, so many other witnesses that had to come, that did come forward that corroborated different parts of the story that had been told. So I think taking the whole into account is something that every jury does, and certainly I would imagine that that's what this jury did here as what well. What sense did you get from these jurors? Do you think they got it? I mean, I would say you need to look at guilty verdict, but talking to them, was there a sense that this was going to end up this way? Um, I don't know that I had any more sense than anyone else uh, in terms of uh, usually when giving a closing argument, certainly that's something where I'm focused more on making sure that I'm telling and recounting what happened truthfully and accurately for the jury. Um, you folks would be in a better position than I would to be able to read the jury and try to interpret what how they were receiving. How about in terms of him not showing up to court? How, do you think that, how did that impact the trial system? Well, the jury was specifically instructed. They could not take that into account. They could not even discuss that during deliberation. So uh, we imagine that the jury followed the judge's instructions and that that was not taken into account. Um, that is his choice. Uh, if he chooses to, to not be here for trial, then that's uh, that's what he would like, and that's what he gets. Are you looking forward to seeing him at sentencing? I mean, you've, you've been working on this case for some time. The only thing I can respond to that is at the last sentencing um, that occurred, which was last year, he stated that he did not kill his daughter and that he looked forward to the trial. We look very much forward to sentencing. May I ask the police chief one? Yeah, the chief. The boss one. Sure, Chief Holmberg. And some of those early press conferences, you were very emotional talking about this. <clears throat> a little on your feelings today. Yeah, um, I want to thank the team. Um, I didn't do anything on this. Um, Detective, <laughs> Detective Max Rahill, uh, Jack Dunleavy, Captain Layton, Captain Larishell, where I am. I know you're back there somewhere. Um, and many others back in the room, Jesse O'Neill. Um, Lions um, and these two gentlemen here, um, state of New Hampshire is lucky to have uh, people like Attorney Agati and Attorney Knowles um, going after justice for for victims. Yeah, it's, it's been an emotional ride. Um, I'll leave it at that. What was it like we for you to hear? You made sure you were here during the trial, and you were also here when the jury delivered that verdict guilty. What was it like when you heard that verdict guilty? Feel good for the team, honestly. Um, dedicated. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, still got to find it. Um, it's kind of where it's been articulated that well. Um, if anybody, please, I mean, this girl deserves better than the life that she had. Um, and at least this team, uh, I'm thankful to the media as well, who kept Harmony's story out there. Mm -hmm. Bob, I know you did, Amy, uh, many others. Um, and you did it respectfully. Um, you did it with dignity. So we appreciate that. And um, I just, um, there's never a good day with these things. Um, this isn't about winning or losing. This is about a, a five-year-old girl that was murdered um, by her father. And I can think of no worse um, crime. And I'm looking forward, and I know they are, um, to seeing them and seeing them in sentencing. Chief, I noticed Harmony's mother give you a handshake after everything. What did that mean? I just a simple gesture. Thank you. Um, I mean, what, what do you say? You know, um, mother lost her her daughter. Um, 
you know, this stuff. You know, she, she felt like she couldn't get anybody's attention. She kept sounding the alarm, and it wasn't until she got to Manchester PD that somebody listened. Yeah, and uh, Jack Dunleavy right there, he's the one that listened. Um, and went to Lieutenant La Rochelle at the time, um, and went to Captain Layton, and we listened. Um, and a couple other people at the back of the room, and many over there. Um, we listened. And, I'll, you know, I got to be careful, but, you know, there's been, there's been some failures here. Um, and those failures were not on the part of the Manchester Police Department. Um, I will stand by that um, till the end of my career and beyond. Um, I still firmly believe that some people in some other agencies need to be held accountable. Um, and I'm, I'm asking for that. This little five-year-old girl, she deserves somebody to be held accountable that failed along the way. Because we wouldn't be standing here today if other people had done their job. And if that hurts feelings, Ben's looking at me. I'm getting the look. Um, There's only one person I hold accountable, Chief, but that's all right. You just found him guilty. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> Chief, you mean the state of Massachusetts and the state of New Hampshire? Yeah, yeah, I do. All right, being honest with you. Um, will that ever happen? I don't know. But the man ultimately who is responsible for this act has been found guilty of a brutal, brutal murder. But Chief, I'm assuming you're not necessarily the child shouldn't be able to go unseen for two years without anybody taking notice. Blows my mind. You're on the pulse of the city. What's the temperature of the community out there right now? Well, I haven't been outside the building yet. Um, <laughs> I got to imagine um, as a community, greater Manchester area, the state of New Hampshire, um, probably feels pretty good right now that we collectively as a state did our part on behalf of uh, Harmony. And, you know, wherever she is right now, um, maybe she, you know, feels it. Um, and feels what we what we're able to get done because of this team here and Amy is the advocates. They're here somewhere. Ladies, all right. Um, didn't want to forget you guys. Um, so, and the people listening at home, there's a tip line still open. There is a tip line will remain open. Um, don't ask me that off the top of my head right now because I got a lot <laughs> going on. Um, but the tip line is open. That's out there publicly available on our website and uh, many other places. So, um, yes. To the attorney got his point. Somebody's got to, I'm still convinced somebody's out there knows something a little bit more about where she may be, perhaps. Um, and when the weather starts to break and people start getting out and walking around in areas that they would, normally wouldn't in the winter, um, maybe they keep a little extra eye open, right? And maybe we, we catch a break. When do you think she expect she this to be sentenced? Um, I was about to say, I think I got that answer. With regards to the sentencing on that, um, I expect that sentencing will probably be somewhere around, um, it could potentially be either uh, just before the beginning of April, end of March, or it could be into May. It could take some time. It's all up to the court schedule on that, and it also there needs to be adequate time. So we're estimating it's probably going to be at least a couple of hours, probably two or three hours for sentencing to take place. Um, that's all on the court schedule, and we'll abide whatever the court says. Can you offer us a range? Minimum? Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> maximum minimum. So, all right. So I've got to go through all the charges. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with New Hampshire, uh, New Hampshire, when you get a felony sentence, you get two numbers. One is a minimum number, and there's a maximum number. The minimum number uh, can be no more than half of what the maximum number is. Essentially, your minimum number is the amount of time that you will spend there, and when you hit your minimum number, you are then eligible for parole. You may or you may not make parole, and then you stay on parole all the way up until your maximum number if you make it. Um, so that's under the power of the Department of Corrections. Um, essentially, for the crime of abuse of a corpse, that is a Class A misdemeanor in New Hampshire, and that is punishable by a maximum of 12 months in the County House of Corrections. With regards to the second degree assault, as well as the falsifying physical evidence, um, and the witness tampering. Each one of those are class B felonies, maximum punishables up to three and a half to seven years in the state prison, plus a $5,000 fine and five years probation. With regards to the charge of second degree murder, the murder there is anything up to life with the possibility of parole. However, here Harmony was under the age of 13, which means under the operation of RFA, RSA 651 colon six, the minimum that the court should impose is 35 to life. Those sentences, whatever the court chooses to impose, 
They could be concurrent or consecutive with one another, but they must be consecutive to career criminal charges that he was sentenced with last year, which means that whatever the court gives for sentencing from today's convictions will be consecutive to the 33 and a half to 67 year sentence he got last year for the two armed career criminal charges. Fair to say he's never getting out if we wanted to shorthand it? It's a lot of time. <laughs> and I hope I'm not practicing at the time that that minimum date ever comes around. And the, the, the intercom kind of interrupted you were talking about how it's possible that we could still find evidence that the way she may have been wrapped up. That's possible. And I'd also like to ask you, in your closing, you talked about how she was brought with her dignity and peace and a tombstone to go over her head to be battered by the police. Correct. So put that all together for me. Why is this so important that we still remember and find Ami, even though her father has not been given an autopsy? It's important that we find her for dignity, for respect for another human being. It's, it's not about a feather in the cap. And, and none of these people here, none of all those agencies that I listed, it's not about a feather in the cap to say that we found her. It's about this is what she deserves. That's what you deserve. That's what I deserve. Everybody has that level of dignity that they should be afforded. And Harmony is just like anybody else. She deserves to have that too. And so the search is going to continue for her until we're able to find her. Can I ask Dunleavy a question? At the mic? At the mic. Oh, <laughs> Your name was invoked over and over again as the, uh, you know, the lead on this investigation. Get, just give us a sense of it. Uh, overwhelming. Um, got about 10 years on the job right now, and I never in my wildest dreams that a case like this would uh, be something that I'd be assigned to. But I credit the people that I work with for gaining the experience I did to come to a great resolution today. Um, I have great bosses. I have a great partner. I couldn't have done it without Max. He's become one of my best friends. Um, Obviously, today is a great win, but it still feels like uh, it's not complete. When we find her, uh, I'm going to be on the job for some time. I still have about 15 years left, and as long as I'm a police officer, I'm going to continue to look for her. Is there something that you recall in your first conversation with Mr. Story that made you no, I, I just listened. Where other people might not have, I chose to listen to her and gather all the facts and try to understand the, the whole picture. Um, Mr. Montgomery, I had actually met him before um, in a time of need, so I was able to try to establish some rapport with him when I first met him. I had no dealings with uh, Mrs. Sori prior to that, but um, I'm glad that she can come to me as a resource from here on out if she ever needs anything. Can you take us inside that room when Kayla was actually walking through? what happened and how that child was moved away. Could you believe what you were hearing? It's it's really tough. You've never, you know, you can imagine for all this time we were trying to imagine in our minds what had happened and try to put the pieces together. But I don't know if any of us in that room could have imagined that was the details that uh, would have emerged when it was all said and done. Um, but obviously it's got us going. Um, in the case, we, we started collecting the necessary information we needed to, and now this is where we are today. Was it hard to talk to her and get information out of her, or did she just kind of offer it up? Uh, of course, it's difficult to hear details like that, especially to a person like myself who deals with only uh, cases where kids are physically and sexually abused. Uh, but I have a job to do. I can't let my emotions get in the way. So. Although it was difficult, uh, yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. Of course, it was difficult. Anybody would have been hard was it pressed to get, to get answers out of her because wasn't she under us? Uh, yeah. Was it hard to get answers out of her? I, again, I, I can't speak to that. We we had a scheduled meeting with her, and, and the questions that were asked were what were asked, and the responses were true. Sure. Can I follow up on that just for a sure. second? I think one of going to your question, I think one of the important things to also recall is that. Um, she came and testified. So she had to be there for hours of cross-examination, several hours of direct examination, so that her recount of what had occurred uh, had to be looked at and tested in front of the jury. And that's in fact what happened. 
Um, so I think that, yes, there are certainly different statements that all witnesses make in different cases at different times. But the question is, do they then come forward? Do they then get up on that stand? And then can people individually look at them and be able to decide, okay, now that I'm hearing this, what do I believe to be true? And the jury's verdicts today certainly go ahead and reflect what this jury believed to be true at the end with regards to the defendant's culpability. And were so, you concerned that you were going to lose her testimony through the defense motions? And would that be a different outcome? Um, concerned whether or not we're losing testimony. With regards to the motions, I think we certainly rest on our pleadings, and the court um, certainly considered that in making the court's ruling. Um, with regards to the outcome, um, we are here to try to make sure that the full truth is presented in front of the jury, regardless of what the outcome is. Um, prosecutors in this state do not get paid more whether you find get guilty or not guilty. In fact, we're sworn not to. We're sworn to seek justice, whatever that may be. Um, I can tell you even myself, one time I was in, uh, it didn't happen to be a homicide case, but it was another case when we realized that the co-defendant could not have done it. We dismissed that charge in the middle of trial because that's not the prosecutor's job. The prosecutor's job is to seek justice, whatever it is. So whether or not, what that meant for the verdict here on testimony, that was not a concern. Chief, um, Chief with the guilty verdict today, do you have a message to the defendant, Adam Montgomery, after everything that he's put this community through, everything your department has gone through over the past weeks and months and years? And keep in mind, Chief, there are uh, other things, of course, that are still going on. Yeah, I better leave that one alone. Um, what I hope for, honestly, is um, maybe, you know, he's certainly probably aware of the verdict by now, um, and maybe within him um, is a small shred of decency um, that causes him to um, maybe let us more soul or Whatever's going on there, um, maybe he has a shred of decency that let's do the right thing. And how are you feeling today? I'm I'm good. Um, you know, we're we're good. It, um, you know, MPD is a resilient police department, um, and yes, this is a major major case. Um, probably in, in everybody's career up here, um, never seen anything like this, uh, and hopefully never seeing like this again. And, but we'll we'll push through, and we got a we got a job to do, and we got to get on to um, you know other matters. Um, all these Jack's got a caseload, Max got a caseload. Um, this isn't the only case they got, um, so it, you know it's a good day. Attorney Knowles, your reaction? I'm um, obviously happy with the verdict, as, as Attorney Agata mentioned. Um, looking forward to some rest and relaxation. I think one other thing with regards to um, Attorney Knowles is certainly, uh, is Attorney Knowles and I are, are only two parts of the trial team. We could not do this without the incredible work of uh, the victim advocates on this particular case who are assigned, they're actually standing behind you. Um, and in making sure that the victim's family understands what's going on, to make sure that they're informed and that witnesses are organized, and also uh, to make sure that the communication still flows freely, that they understand what's going on with the court process. Um, and some of the other work also from the Attorney General's office is certainly we have an amazing group of administrative assistants and paralegals uh, who we work with every day that help get us ready for trial, help us be able to present the information, and uh, an incredible amount of work by some of the attorneys that formerly were on this case. Um, and I'm referring specifically to attorney uh, Heather Shaniski and also Shay Roberts, but none more so than uh, former Assistant Attorney General uh, Jesse O'Neill, um, who now uh, happens to work in a different line of work, uh, still doing a great job representing clients, but um, the amount of work that he put forward on this case, again, was a lion, uh, just like the rest of the officers here. So, just have to yeah. ask, is being soft spoken a technique? <laughs> what, what is that? Um, I don't know if I've got a good answer for that one. Both of you. Got a good answer for that one. Yeah. Um, my family's very loud, so I tend to lower my voice a little bit. But anyway, we've got to go grab and do some other stuff. So I hope we answered everybody's questions. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So there's the press release um, for Harmony, and she did get justice today. And let's see what happens with the CPS changes. Hopefully, they will come sooner than later, and there will be a lots and lots of reform. Just keep fighting around the world for changes for all of our future children, and keep in mind of all the children that we cover daily. Again, like I said, that the awareness isn't over for Harmony. I love you all. Have a great day.